founder of Cure CMD and the director of the CMDIR, and I would like to introduce you to um, Sweta Gergenrass, who joins us from the Department of Health Sciences at Boston University and uh, has been an exceedingly dedicated CMD scientist um, from the early years uh, in uh, her postdoctoral time. And she has been focused primarily on one form of congenital muscular dystrophy, and that is LAMA2 CMD. So without further ado, uh, I will turn over the mic to uh, Dr. Gergenrath, who will be uh, giving us an update on the research that she's currently doing. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, and uh, thank, thanks for the introduction. And uh, today I will be basically, as Anna said, I will be going over and giving you an overview of um, what's going on in the lab, which has been going on and is going on currently. So, so the overall focus of my lab is to understand the pathomechanism of LAMA uh, to CMD, which is a rare form of congenital muscular dystrophy. And the ultimate goal of tar, you know, identifying some of the therapeutic targets and hopefully to bring some of these uh, treatments into clinics. So CMDs, uh, as you know, is a uh, group of highly heterogeneous uh, uh, group of neuromuscular dis disorders. And typically, these uh, forms of dis uh, uh, disease are inherited in uh, autosomal recessive fashion, which means that two copies of the gene have to be defective in order for the disease manifestation. Typically, as the name suggests, the disease is presented pretty early on, within the first 12 months of life. And unlike Duchenne, these, these diseases can affect both males and female children. So the LAMA2 related congenital muscular dystrophy or LAMA2 CMD is the focus of my research and it's also a multi-system disorder and again like other CMDs it is it pretty much presents very very early on. It is relative, it, it is the second most prevalent form of congenital muscular dystrophy however as as we know that the total prevalence of CMDs is rare. It's uh, 1 in 1.4 million. Maybe uh, I'm a little off and I can correct. Um, and uh, the, pre the incident rate is 1 in, one, one in 20,000. But even though it's rare, it's important to the disease is very aggressive and it's important to identify some therapies which is not there at there's no therapies at, in place at this time. So typically, the clinical features of this disease include muscle weakness, hypotonia, which is low muscle tone in muscle, the contractures in the uh, joints, and children often have spinal deformation and respiratory complications. And oftentimes, when the protein is completely missing, these children do not achieve ambulation. So just a little quick overview of muscle uh, class 101. If you look at the muscle cross-section of a healthy muscle, what you typically see are these muscle cells or muscle fibers, which are very uniform in size, as you can see here. And the nuclei of these fibers are at the periphery. And as uh, just a quick note that uh, muscle cells, a mature muscle cell or muscle fiber is made by union of several young muscle cells. And what is important is in a healthy muscle, there is no, the, if you look at between the muscle fibers or muscle cells, there's very little interstitial space. And this space is basically has connective tissue, but it's very little. And you don't see any inflammatory infiltrating cells. Now if you look at a diseased muscle, you see that the five muscle fiber or muscle cells are very ununiform in, cell, in size. There are some big matured muscle fibers sitting with the peripheral uh, muscle um, nuclei, but also you can see that uh, there are centrally located uh, small triangular fibers with central nuclei in the center. These are the regenerating muscle fibers. So muscle cells are dying and some muscles cells are regenerating. But you can also see here there's this lot of interstitial space between the fibers and these are typically filled with uh, inflammatory cells 
as well as fibrous tissue. So muscle cells, when upon injury, can die. They can die uh, utilizing two of, of two pathways. One is necrosis, and the other one is apoptosis. Necrosis is typically, which is a passive way of dying, when there is some external factors which get you know, cause muscle inj cell injury, these cells die passively, they release all their, you know, content outside and there's lots of inflammation. But the, and contrary to necrosis, there is this apoptosis, which is also called programmed cell death, which is a, typically a natural mechanism of cell death. And normally during development, organs, or, or organisms utilize this anyways. And, but, this apoptosis or program cell that, as the name suggests, it is not a passive uh, function. The, the cell actively has to initiate a bunch of steps in order to go through such cell death. There has to be, you know, there has to be presence of certain proteins in order to cause apoptosis. And this form of cell death is very prevalent in LAMA2 CMD. So I wanted to emphasize on apoptosis. So the other thing is, when the cells die, the muscle cell, uh, muscle tissue in general, as we know, is very quiet tissue when it's totally mature. Not much is happening. Not new cells are being made. But when the muscle cells go or the muscle tissue goes through some injury, either it's a you know acute trauma, uh, the muscle gets injured or slashed, or exercise-related injury or disease where there's constant you know, state of injury, there are satellite cells or muscle stem cells, and these are the cells which come into play when there is some injury. So typically, this is just a schematic showing you that, that the muscle progenitor cells are sitting in the periphery in a special little area of its own, and it sits quietly most of the time. But if there is an injury, they just get activated. And once they get activated, they start multiplying. They make many of themselves. There are many, many myoblasts. And then they mature. And then they go. And either they can fuse with the injured muscle fiber and to repair it, or they can make muscle cell or muscle fiber de novo, a new muscle tube. Or uh, myofiber altogether. So this is a process of regeneration and this is typically not so, this process of regeneration is not so much seen in our form of dystrophy. So this is just showing you another cross-section and area of satellite cell. So a little bit of, uh, of uh, extracellular matrix. Our protein, the laminin LAMA2 or laminin211 is an extracellular matrix protein. And here is basically, again, a schematic of what you see in a muscle tissue. If you see a whole muscle, a bunch of muscle bundles, uh, muscle fiber bundles are surrounded by a connected tissue fiber layer, which is called epimesium. But within that are muscle bundles, the fiber bundles, and that is surrounded yet again by another set of fibrous uh, connective tissue, which is called the paramecium. And then when you look within these bundles, each muscle, and these little round ones are representing the muscle cells, and they themselves are surrounded by another set of connective tissue called endomecium. And here in the bottom, you can see an electron microscope of a muscle cross-section where the muscle protein has been taken away and what is left is this uh, the connective tissue scaffold like right here. So there was muscle fiber inside which has been taken away and now you can just see this uh, you know, outside connective tissue. And this is much more, if you go zoom much more in, here is a muscle. Now, well, this is yet another yet another uh, electron, microsco um, um, ele electron micrograph which shows you a muscle fiber and, and, the, on the, and the extracellular matrix right here. So this is, the this is the fiber inside, this is the extracellular matrix, 
and here is the muscle cell membrane. So you can see that the muscle cell membrane is sitting very close to this ex extracellular matrix. Now, extracellular matrix is important. It, it, of course, it's for scaffolding and giving some strength overall strength to the muscle cells, but it's also very important because it is it is it is with this area is the muscle cell is communicating and there are many, many proteins here which are communicating constantly with the inside of the cell through the cell membrane. And this also, this extracellular matrix are, is also a hub basically for lots of growth factors and cytokines and other factors which are important to maintain the overall health of the muscle cell. So if you convert this electron micrograph into a schematic, this is what it will look like. This is inside is the muscle cell, and here is the muscle cell membrane, and this is the extracellular matrix. And these are, there's lots of proteins, some big fibrous proteins like collagen fiber, then there are lots of other molecules called proteoglycan molecules, glycoproteins, so on and so forth. And here you can see that they are constantly interacting through the outside into inside the so basically cell is communicating outside to inside and inside to outside. And that's where our protein comes into play. Laminin 211, here is a, it's a heterotrimeric protein. And here I have just shown you the same schematic, a little bit modified. Here is a protein at the membrane which is interacting with the laminin 211, which is called integrin. And there's yet another protein, which is the dystroglycan, which is also in, in, interacting with laminin 211. And it is, it is uh, understood now, well, well understood now that these, this interaction, this communication is extremely important for muscle cell health, overall health of the muscle cell. Okay, so here is. Um, Again, a diagram of the laminin 211. It's a heterotrimeric or three, three molecules come and make a complex, which is called 211. And laminin, two, laminin alpha 2 is part of that complex. And that's the protein which is defective in LAMA2 CMD. And here I shall show that interaction once again. But as I mentioned, that it is it, this interaction with the cell at with the integrin molecule, which is another protein, and the dystroglycan molecule is important for overall health of the muscle. But this laminin 211 is also interacting with various other molecules in the extracellular matrix, and the mis, you know lack of those interactions could be also playing a role. And we are trying to understand what's going on at that level too, like you know. There is perlecon, there is fibrillin, nidogen, there are many more collagen, there are many more other proteins in the ECM with which laminin 211 interacts. So when you have loss of laminin protein, so absence of laminin, then that causes a disruption in the structural stability of the cell. But as I said, it also causes disruption of communication or signal transduction at the membrane out of the cell, of the muscle cell. And as a result of this loss of structural stability and the signaling, you know, at, uh, sig uh, and the communication, you have secondary manifestation of the disease. And what you see are all these pathomechanisms initiate. Like I said, apoptosis, when the cell cannot, when the integrin and the uh, laminin don't in, in talk to each other, you have the cell thinks that um, there is no uh, communication and it, it initiates programmed cell death or apoptosis. But it also causes um, chronic inflammation. The muscle cells get inflamed. There is lots of, um, there's a problem with regeneration. There is a, the muscle cell cannot regenerate very well. And then you see lots of fibrosis or lots of fibrous tissues come into play in that interstitial space that I was talking about. And all these processes together result in muscle loss. So my lab's interest is working at all these the proteins that are involved in all these cause battle mechanisms, such as BACs which is a pro-apoptotic protein, meaning that this, this protein is required for apoptosis to happen. If you take this protein away, there will be, you can block apoptosis. 
Then there's NF kappa B, which is uh, basically a pro molecule which is known to promote um, inflammation. Then there is IGF-1 or insulin growth factor 1, which is a factor we know that if you can give, the, it facilitates or improves regeneration or you know, cell repair processes. And then there is TGF-beta, or which is also called transforming growth factor beta. That's a molecule which is a key player in promoting fibrosis. And if you take it away, you can actually block fibrosis and you can improve. Um, so you can uh, target fibrotic disease by blocking this uh, TGF beta molecule. So I will basic model that I work with is a mouse model. There are several mouse models available for um, for uh, studying LAMA2 CMD. Of the several mouse models that are available, I work with this DYW model, or LAMA2 DYW model. So it is also very similar uh, to the uh, human uh, pathology. These mice are born very frail. They are much smaller. And they are also do not live very long, which is shown in the survival curve. It basically, the disease mouse dies very quickly within first two months. They show leg contractures. And if you look at their muscle biopsies under the microscope, you can see the cells which are dying through apoptosis. There's lots of fibrosis. And there's lots of inflammatory cells. We also look for uh, regenerative capacities. We can measure it. And we see that there's not much regenerative capacity of these muscles in these mice. So there are three parts to my uh, talk. Um, I will talk a little bit about what we now know about the earlier uh, pathology in this mouse, because most of the studies had been focused in mice which were four to six week old, but that's almost an adult mouse. Since the disease is uh, so congenital and it's present so early on, we did not know much about um, how this disease promotes. So, do, for example, I talked about you know apoptosis. I talked about regeneration. Are these all you know going wrong right in the beginning, or is it a progressive um, you know, disease with one pathological mechanism showing earlier uh, followed by the other? So, that therefore we started and we did some studies to understand what are the early signatures of the pathology. Then, of course, we have uh, looked at multiple therapeutic targets. If, when we do interventions, what are the outcomes in these cases? And um, then we have looked at respiratory and other, um, other uh, non-invasive measures of treatment also. So in the early signature of this disease, that's the first part. And what we did was we started looking at very early time point, at, uh, starting at one week, two week, three week, and four week. Here, these are graphs showing in open circle the DY or the disease mouse model compared to the, uh, the solid black circles, which are the healthy muscles. So you can look at the body weight in the first graph, where you can see when they are born at one week time point, you do not see much difference in their overall body weight. They are slightly smaller than their healthy litter mate. But and within first two weeks, it's very similar. But as we go forward, we see that these, while the wild type animals are gaining weight, the, the disease muscle do, do not, the disease animal does not uh, gain much weight. So this postnatal growth is totally missing in these uh, llama to DY mouse. And that is reflected also in overall growth of the muscles. Here I have in three different graphs TA muscle, which is the tibialis anterior. This is the gastrocnemius muscle. Uh, and this is the quadricep muscle. And all of them show the same trend, that we do not see postnatal growth in uh, followed from two week, three week, and four week. So we also look at the cross-sectional area of the muscle. That is, you take the muscle and you cut a cross-section, and you measure the diameter of the muscle. And at one week, so this is a cross-sectional area, at one week, two week, up to four week. At one week, there is no difference. But as you go forward, the wild type again shows the growth. The diameter of the muscle grows bigger, while the DY muscle does not show that increase. 
But what is more interesting is that even though at this time point, at one week, you can see the overall diameter of the muscle is uh, very similar, if you look at the total number of muscle cell in the DY compared to the wild type, this is much, the, the DY muscle has far few muscle fibers at one, as early as one week compared to the the wild type muscle, suggesting either these fibers have already died or or there's not enough fibers that have been made to begin with. And you can just see here when you look at the histology of the cross section, the biopsy under the scope, you this is one week time point and you can see what we saw in the last slide is reflected here where there are far few cells, muscle fibers in pink and compared to the wild type, which is very compact. Even, and they are small, but they are compact. There's not much interstitial space. But if you look at the DY animal, there's a lot of interstitial space. And there's lots of inflammatory cells here sitting in between. And that reflects why the muscle fibers are, you know, the overall cross-section was similar, but there's not enough muscle fiber. And these cells do grow over time. And uh, at by four-week time point, you see that the muscle cells have grown some, but all these inflammatory cells are now sitting in pockets. You, we have a way to measure the apoptotic uh, nuclei, which are the dying cells, basically with this stain called tunnel. And all I want you to see that as early as one week, we see quite a few tunnel positive or apoptotic cells which are dying. So the cell that apoptosis is ongoing as early as one week. And it continues at all time point, two week, three week, and four week time point. So if you look at, so we have also a way to measure fibrosis. You can use this stain called serious red staining. It stains the collagen red. And you can also uh, quantify the amount of collagen with this this assay, which is called hydroxyproline assay. So it's just quantification of the amount of collagen. So when we do that, we see that even though there's lots of interstitial space and we have lots of fibrous tissue, we see less collagen in the interstitium as, we, as early as one week and two weeks. But by three and four weeks, you see a lot more collagen fibers in the um, interstitium. And that is also reflected by this hydroxyproline quantification which is this chart, this graph showing here. But at one week, and one week there is not much going on. Uh, but by two weeks, it's starting. And then by three and four weeks, it's pretty significantly higher. So collagen content increases over time. We, as I said, that there are many more proteins in the interstitial or extracellular matrix that we are getting more and more interested in. And we looked at the expression at the gene level of all these proteins. We have also looked at the proteins. I am just showing you the gene data. And you can see there's, for example, osteopontin, periostin, fibronectin, tenesin, thrombospondin. These are all Metricellular protein that is sitting in the matrix of the ECM, and they all play a role in either inflammation and fibrosis and so on and so forth. And they are all high very early on. So we now know that the disease, even in the mouse, starts very early on. There are multiple signaling or the communication pathways which are, which are um, already uh, on, have ongoing. Um, and the pathways which are uh, defective very early on. We know that lots and lots of metricellular proteins are dysregulated very early on. And we know, with these initial, uh, the study of these initial pathology, this we think can be very important because now we know that you can target, you know, based on these data, that apoptosis is a very early on um, pathology. Inflammation is a very early on pathology. So to design you know, treatments targeting these pathomechanisms early on could be more meaningful. So from here, I'm uh, switching to what are we looking, you know, the, the different therapeutic targets uh, that we are looking uh, to uh, as intervention in this, uh, this form of congenital muscular dystrophy. 
So we have tried various single mode therapies, and I will focus only on few here. But you can see there's a litany of uh, things that we have tried. Um, so importantly, we have tried. I showed you this protein BAX, which is uh, pro apoptotic protein. We started our studies by inhibiting that protein, and we. Uh, and uh, so both at genetic level and also with a drug called doxycycline here, here, and which is also known to have an anti-apoptotic effect. And then I will focus a little bit on this IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor 1, uh, which promotes regeneration. And then eventually I will talk a little bit on losartan, which is uh, angiotensin 2, which receptor inhibitor, um, type 1 inhibitor. And this is typically a drug used for hypertension. Uh, but it's also known to uh, affect uh, fibrosis. So when we inhibit this back protein genetically, that we take this lamellin deficient mouse and we cross with another mouse which do not express this back protein, then we generate a mouse which is lamellin deficient yet not expressing back protein. And we see a remarkable rescue. Of, here is the survival curve again. A um, mouse which is expressing Vax, normal levels of Vax protein, that's a pro-apoptotic protein, and is de laminin deficient, dies pretty early on, you're seeing this graph. But when you take that Vax protein away, you see that there's a remar remarkable uh, rescue of survival. You promote survivability in these mice. And um, you see that even when there is even one copy of the protein taken away, this is like VAX plus minus, means it's only expressing one copy of VAX, one, one copy less than the normal situation, and you have already improved the survive, survival with this um, removal of one copy. These mice are also bigger compared to the laminin deficient mouse, and here in green, it's shown in green. But what I want, to, want you to take away is that, yes, indeed, these these animals which do not express Vax are bigger compared to the untreated mouse, but they are much smaller than the wild-type mouse, which is shown in black. And that is also shown in the muscle weight here. So what we got from Vax intervention was that if you inhibit Vax, you get improvement in survivability. You see some improvement in uh, overall weight. But you do not, what I didn't show you, is you don't, there is a lot of inflammation and fibrosis which is still there if, if we inhibit Vax protein. So my other approach was that since we know that the muscle does not um, regenerate very well, what happens if we overexpress insulin-like growth factor one. Again, this was a genetic intervention where we took the laminin deficient mouse and we crossed it with a mouse which is just overexpressing insulin-like growth factor in its muscle and we wanted to see the outcome. And when we do that, we again see here is the survival curve. We indeed have some, we have given it um, an improvement in terms of survival, survivability. These animals are living longer, much longer than the untreated mouse. They are also bigger compared to the untreated mouse here in open circle. The solid circles are the IGF overexpressing laminin deficient mouse, and you can see that they have a better growth curve, and their muscle weights are also bigger. We also looked at muscle function just to just to look at you know test whether these mouse are also not only bigger but their muscles have more capacity of. Uh, um, generating force. And one way to do it was just to look at, you know, how how often the mouse stands up in its hind legs because that gives us a, you know, un non invasive measure of um, you know, weight lifting capacity of these legs. And if you look at just count very simply count the number of uh, stand ups, you can see that the laminin deficient mouse uh, without any without this intervention does not do very well. And you can improve this stand up capacity if you overexpress IGF one. We also look at what you call a retraction. If you hang if you hold a mouse by its tail, typically normal mouse will be hovering its feet out and we will be able to hold this uh, position for a long time. Like we measure up to ten seconds. Here and 
typically a wild type mouse would keep its mouth, uh, its uh, legs extended over 10 seconds. But the the lavender deficient mouse, as soon as you hang it by its tail, it just pulls, it retracts its legs close to its body, like shown in this picture. And and when you have this intervention, you can see that the laminin deficient mouse cannot do this very well. And when you overexpress IGF-1, this function is improved. So with IGF-1 alone, we saw some improvement with back inhibition, we saw some improvement. But in both these cases, we saw that the muscle fiber, when you looked at the muscle histology, there was still lots of inflammation and there was still fibrosis going on. So my thought was that since it is, this disease has so many drivers, you know, like apoptosis, failed regeneration, what if we could target more than one of these mechanisms or, or pathological mechanisms at one time? And with that in mind, we combined the treatment of overexpression of IGF-1 and back inhibition. The first set of study was just using, again, genetic intervention. So now we took this laminin deficient mouse, then we crossed it with this IGF-1 overexpressing mouse. What happens when this mouse now is overexpressing IGF-1? And then we did another cross in, uh, in which we could remove the back protein. So now we generated an animal which was deficient in its laminin alpha-2. It was overexpressing IGF-1, but not expressing the pro-apoptotic protein back. And when we do that, we indeed see an additive effect. Here in the graph of the weight, and in the first graph you can see there's a weight of these animals. And here is the untreated mouse. This is the IGF-1 treated mouse. This is a back inhibited mouse. And this is the one which is which has both, which is, which is overexpressing IGF-1 and is also not expressing BAX. And when we look at the muscle function, you can see that we also have, I mean, by BAX alone has a good uh, improvement, but when we add these two, it has even better muscle function. But what was best is shown in the, in the next slide here, where is the muscle biopsy of all these different treatments. This is untreated laminin deficient uh, muscle. Again, lots of lots of interstitial space, lots of um, infiltrating cells, fibrosis going on. I give alone, again, we see central nucleated fibers. As you remember, I told those are the newly regenerating fibers. We see many of those, but we still see inflammatory cells and we still see fibrosis. Similarly with backs alone, we, the muscle is bigger, but we again have inflammation as well as fibrosis. And here in the D panel, D, you see a uh, biopsy from a muscle of this double treated mouse. And you can immediately see there's a huge improvement in overall muscle, um, muscle pathology. These muscle fibers are very uniform. There's very little remarkable improvement in this space, interstitial space between the muscle cells, then very little fibrosis and inflammation going on. And this is as a for a comparison, I have a wild type mouse or a healthy mouse here. So here is a little video of showing you uh, first uh, uh, untreated mouse sitting quietly, it has paralyzed legs, cannot move, and then there is a uh, uh, double treatment. And here is the, the very quick. Um, as you can see, this mouse is not only bigger, it looks very, very healthy and has a uh, lot of movement, uh, near normal movement capacities. So, the, we also did another study where we used this uh, molecule called IPLEX, which is an uh, uh, exogenous uh, IGF-1 molecule. It's a recombinant IGF-1. So now we were treating the DY mouse, DYW Bax mouse, the mouse which is a laminin deficient mouse, which is not expressing Bax molecule. But now we are giving IGF IGF-1 from outside as a therapy um, at about uh, starting at two weeks of time uh, postnatally. And we see very, very similar results uh, here in black, superimposed by blue. The blue one is the one you, which you already saw, which was the transgenic overexpression of IGF-1 in the back um, knockout background. And this one is the 
uh, IGF treatment um, as a therapy. And you can see that we do achieve a very similar um, outcome with the uh, therapeutic um, intervention of IGF also, shown that this is a back IPLEX treatment um, histology, and this is the Backs. I, uh, it, this is showing you uh, serious red staining as I showed before, but very little interstitial space. The muscle looks very healthy. So, as I was mentioning, this losartan, which is the ang ang angiotensin II receptor uh, type one inhibitor, as a, you know, hypertensive antihypertensive drug essentially, but which also shows um, antifibrotic effect, has been used by two other labs as well as us, and we see that it helps to improve fibrosis in this. Um, in this mouse model, and which is shown here in this HNE histology stain, you can see that the muscle fibers. There's very little fibrosis going on. The there's little less interstitial space, you know, less number of infiltrating cells, as well as um, very little fibrosis. And we do see an improvement when we treat with losartan, uh, starting again at two or three weeks time point after birth. We see very, very uh, remarkable improvement in their functional capacity. Again, this is a stand-up data. Just by using losartan, we see that they are doing much better compared to the untreated mouse here. But here, now I will focus on the weight curve of these uh, mice. Here is the untreated mouse. Here in green is the losartan treated mouse and compared to the wild type mouse. And what immediately becomes obvious that even though losartan is very um, useful in improving the fibrosis and improving the functional capacity, we do not see any improvement, uh, or I should say very little improvement in the weight of these muscle, uh, of these animals. So again, with the same idea of targeting two components of, in this case, fibrosis, and overall muscle growth and improving regeneration. We, we did another study where we actually took the same laminin deficient mouse, which is overexpressing IGF-1, and then treated those mice with losartan. Now, if you remember, these IGF overexpressing mice are actually, they show increased overall body weight, the muscle size improves, but they do not, they have lots of inflammation and lots of fibrosis going on. And when we combine now losartan and IGF, here in the first graph, again, I show you the weight of these animals, weight curves. And in yellow is the one which is double treatment of IGF overexpression and losartan treatment. And you can see that the losartan treated animals are uh, having advantage in terms of weight gain compared to both the IGF-1 alone shown in red and, um, uh, of course, with the uh, animals treated in losartan are showing in green. So these are, again, uh, weights of different muscle groups also shows improvement in double treatment. But again, I would show what is most remarkable what happens when you combine these treatments is here I show you the H&E of the muscle, uh, muscle histology, uh, untreated mouse first, then the IGF-1 overexpressing mouse, then losartan treatment, double treatment, and the wild type. And in the bottom panel, again, is the serious thread, which is showing fibrosis. And what becomes very clear is what I already said, that when you have IGF overexpression alone, you don't do much to the inflammation as well as the fibrosis. But when you treat it with low sartan alone, you do have much more result, resolution of fibrosis and inflammation. And here is the double treatment where the muscle looks remarkably well, very little um, fibrosis going on, and uh, the less interstitial space, less inflammatory cells, and um, we see a remarkable improvement uh, overall uh, in the pathology. So these both these studies tend to us tell us that if we are targeting two of these plateau mechanisms simultaneously, we are getting a much better overall um, rescue of the pathology. So, so, but there are challenges for such therapies because you know how to. How, what are the challenges of these? You know, double treatment is that you cannot you cannot give a combination treatment 
until you have figured out how each of these molecules will work alone, what are the mechanisms, which are the pathomechanisms that they are targeting alone, and then, you know, and then how they are working uh, in an additive or synergistic manner, um, we need to understand first in order to move on to, you know, move these um, treatments um, into translation. But also another thing which I want to talk for last few minutes is uh, in order to do these uh, rigorous studies of preclinical interventions, we need some meaningful endpoint measurements that so we can measure in the mouse going forward and for a longitudinal study as well as try to validate them in humans whether they will be relevant at all in in a human also so we have started doing some MRI studies in this mouse um, with uh, with uh, uh, collaboration uh, uh, with a lab uh, at uh, University of Florida with, at uh, Dr. Glenn Walter's lab, and they are so. What we do, we take our mouse and we send our mouse to them, and then they can do MRIs on them. And uh, so this is first we have done some baseline studies just to send the DY muscle DY mouse, which are which have not gone through any intervention, and then we he has done some measurements, and I'm just giving you this. MRST2 measurement, and you can see that these are much higher in the disease animals compared to the wild type mouse, and this can be also suggesting that there is ongoing pathology. And so then, what he does is that after he has measured the MRIs, he sends us, he collects the tissues from the animals, and he sends those tissues back so that we can core, we can look at the histology and see if the MRIs, which uh, which suggest that these are these muscles have ongoing pathology is also uh, correlated at the histology at the tissue level and here is the tissue of the same mouse which you know one of the mouse that we took MRIs uh, on the uh, on the previous slide and you can see both with H and E staining and serious rest staining that there is a lot of uh, a pathology in these uh, mice so we this this, for this particular um, muscle that we are showing you is uh, a lower limb muscle and you can see that both both these uh, uh, assays are telling us that the pathology is ongoing. So then we took some of these low sarton treated mice and we sent them out again to Florida and in this case now you can see that this is this is the uh, DY untreated mouse, which has high MRS values, but when they are treated with uh, low sarton, these these values are going down. They, if you compare, they actually compare to the wild type animals. And then when we look at the tissues, as I showed you before, that the tissues are also looking good in terms of fibrosis and um, interstitial uh, infiltration of uh, inflammatory cells. So it's suggesting to us, then it's basically validating MRI as a endpoint measure in these mice for these ongoing studies. So now we can do progressive studies over a longitudinal period of time and without having to harvest these tissues based on these MR, uh, MRI um, measures, we can predict uh, what the histology of these muscles, whether we are improving actual pathology or not. We are also interested to look at if there are some markers in the serum of these mice that are high to begin with and will be uh, will be regulated uh, upon treatment. And we have identified, we have looked at multiple of such um, molecules, but we have identified two such molecules. One is TIMP1 and the other one, which I already have shown you, transforming growth factor beta and they are circulating in the serum. If you see here uh, in the top um, uh, uh, graph, it's a full change of TIMP1, and it is higher in the DY muscle compared to the wild type muscle in solid black, and upon treatment with losartan, the TIMP1 levels go down here, shown here, and it's a significant reduction of TIMP1 in the circulating serum, uh, in circulating in the serum of these DY mouse. And similarly, TGF beta, we also looked at uh, the levels. There are two forms of TGF beta here, as shown in latent and active. The latent one does not promote fibrosis, and the active one, the, this molecule has to be active in order to promote fibrosis. And you can see both are high. 
um, in the serum of the DY mouse. Uh, here, uh, shown here, but upon treatment with losartan, it is going down in the uh, serum. The levels are going down towards the wild type levels. So suggesting that these two com these two molecules could be potential markers in the serum, which may be indicative of improved um, improved pathology at the muscle level. So we are also I did not show you today. They, we are also looking at the respiratory. Uh, parameters and that is also non-invasive and we have clear um, ideas by now that these uh, those respiratory measures can be also used as um, as indicative of overall uh, health of uh, these muscles uh, these animals so with this I would like to um, thank my lab my postdoc Ajay Kumar and my students who have been um, instrumental in um, making all these studies possible and then my funding agencies but I would also like to take a moment to tell that CRCMD has been one which has really been so instrumental in you know keeping my lab sustained and alive um, uh, and thank you so much for that uh, to, to the CMD community for keeping my research going thank you so much I Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gergen Rath, for this absolutely fantastic uh, overview of your work in the last uh, couple of years and everything that has been learned as a result of your work. Um, I know that uh, this presentation will really um, bring a lot of hope to the hearts of uh, people and families who are affected with CMD. Thanks again. Thank you.